Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to part 2 about the Hajj in the well-known months. As we said in the previous part that Al-Hajj can take place throughout the year in any month of the year just like Umrah. People today go to Umrah at any one part of the year uh, it's okay for them. Well Hajj is the same thing. The only thing that differentiates between the two is when the intention of the person when in Hajj. Are they gonna do Hajj or are they gonna do Umrah? Because if you have done Hajj one time, you don't need to keep repeating it. So just your intention is to do Umrah and Umrah is less, uh, there are a lot less things to do than what you do in Hajj. Since Hajj can take place the entire year, when does it begin and when does it finish? Well, Allah has explained where. It's just the sheikhs chose to ignore what Allah says. Well, Allah says this. Yes, alunaka anil ahilla. One day, people, the believers at the time of the messenger, went to him and asked him about the crescent. When, when we see a new moon, is there anything? What's the significance or significance of it uh, in, in Allah's religion? The reason they asked is this: the Muslims at the time, back at the time of the messenger, they had neighbors. They used to live with tribes of the Jews. The Jewish people used to practice the, the, their Islam based on the Torah that was with them. And they, had, and they had a meaning for almost everything. In the tradition and the religion of the Jews, when the new moon shows, there is always something going on with them. So the Arabs, and of course you know the influence of the Jews talking about things like that, the Arabs went to the messenger and said, what about us when we see the new moon? Is there anything that we should do in particular? And that's why Allah said, yes, alunaka anil ahilla. They ask you about the moon crescents, i.e. the new moon when they is born, what should we do? Then Allah here is going to answer. As I said before, it's not given to the messenger to answer by himself. And that's why in the Quran you find a lot is they ask you about answer. Allah answers. So Allah answers. Qul hiya mawaqeetu linnas. Answer, say, the new moons, they are time marks, they are time reference for mankind. Yeah, when we see new moon, you see something. For example, before when they didn't have calendars, I would tell you, okay, I see you in three new moons. So we start counting. When the new moon comes in, that's first. And then you start the second and the third. And then that's what they do. If I say I see you in five days after the fourth moon, and then you go and you count four moons, and then you make sure you are there at the appointed number five or the fourth day, whatever it is. So that's why Allah says there are time marks for mankind. And then Allah adds another piece of information and he goes Wal Hajj and for the pilgrimage. And this is and this is in Surah Al Baqarah, ayah, uh, Surah number two, the ayah is one eight nine. Meaning that the birth of a new moon has two jobs. One to help humans keep track of time. And the second purpose of the new moon in our Islamic religion is to help us know when Hajj begins. In other words, you cannot go and start Hajj on the 15th day of the month. You have to go to be present in Mecca and you wait for the new moon. As soon as the new moon shows, the Hajj time has begun for you for that month. And you have to be there to witness that new moon. Isn't that beautiful? So if Allah states that Hajj can take place the entire year and just you wait for the new moon and you perform your Hajj in any month of the year, why have the Sheikh restricted Hajj to five days? And then we have this uh, human stampede and Mecca is no longer big and then we have the problems with the hotels and we have, we have, we have. Well, the truth of the matter is one man, one human being at one point in our history single-handedly damaged and changed the face of Islam and turned it into a human Islam rather than a divine one as it should have been.
the man responsible of every evil that struck Allah's Islam is called Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah, the man who changed the face of Islam until our days. This man, he is the son of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is the leader of the Kuffar of Mecca. It's him who led them in Badr, in Uhud, in uh, Hazab, uh, in all these things. Abu Sufyan was, uh, his wife is Hind. In our books of history, they always tell us Hind is the woman who opened the chest of Hamza, the uncle of the messenger, and chewed on his heart because he killed some members of her family. Hind was a dedicated enemy to Islam just like her husband. Muawiyah grew in a household that hated the Prophet Muhammad and hated Bani Hashim. So later on, when the messenger of Allah prevailed and Islam became widely spread, the, the, the Bani Umayyah family, which later on built an entire dynasty and they, they did a lot of horrible things to Islam, at that point there, Abu Sufyan died, Muawiyah came to power after the big uh, the civil war between him and Ali and uh, the assassination of Uthman and all these problems that took place there. In the year 40, after the death of, i.e. Uh, 30 years after the messenger died, 30 years, 3-0, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan did a coup against Ali, assassinated Ali, murdered him and then murdered his son so that he stays in power and then long years of Muslim murdering and assassinations and he did every evil out there to appoint himself as the leader of Muslims and in the year 40 as I said when he uh, climbed the throne of authority and he became the leader of the entire Muslim world he changed the ruling system from Khilafah, from a democratic thing, as the companions Omar, Uthman, Abu Bakr, and Ali did, and he changed it into a kingdom. He became the first king in Al Islam. And since that day, Islam was never the same. Muawiyah created a group of religious people. He was the first one to recruit about 10,000 sheikhs to promote his ideologies. These sheikhs were spread around the Muslim world and they used to receive the khutbah, what to say, and they would preach to people exactly what this Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan wanted. At the time of Muawiyah, there were a lot of revolts, and one day I will make a talk about the revolts, about the wars and the fights and the revolutions that happened in his, against him, because they wanted that Islam to go back to how it were at the time of the messenger. Many, 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 many of them. These people used to, in yearly gatherings, they would go to Mecca for Hajj, to meet there and they decide on what to do. News used to be shared and spread at Hajj time. That didn't work well with Muawiyah. And it is Muawiyah who suddenly took all the vastness of Hajj in the entire year and compiled it to the five days we see today to control the Muslim masses. Then the Salafis came after that and the Salafis, as I said, the Salafis are a direct product of Muawiyah and the tyranny of uh, the, everything that came after him. A hundred years with Bani Umayyah, the family of Muawiyah, ruled the Islamic world. A hundred years they corrupted Islam, changed Islam, invented things of Islam, brainwashed people, and Salafis, as I said, are the guardians of that belief. And that's why the Salafis today insist that they are the only one who are right in Islam, and everyone else is not, because Mr. Muawiyah used to think that, and that's how Islam got corrupted. So the reason why, instead of going through the entire year, all you have to do is wait for the beginning of the new moon to know when you perform Hajj to five days, is because for political reasons. Nothing else. Polit the sheikhs know that the Hajj, if you give them what I gave you today, they will say, yes, this is the truth. If this is the truth, why it's not practiced? Well, it's simple.
because the Saudi government, just like before him, uh, kings, of course, just like before him, the Ottomans, kings, and every 500 years of kings, they have the religious machines before them, another six, 700 years of the Abbasids before them, a hundred and few years of the Umayyads, all these kings, they had their sheikhs, and it was the sheikhs to restrict what Islam was and wasn't. The sheikhs put forward what the hadith narrative said, their opinion before those of Allah. And to make this hajj, the, the, the lie of the 10 days of the hijjah and the hajj in the hijjah and all these things, to promote this, each year Muslims are faced with a list of religious duties. And these duties impose on them many financial and emotional challenges. Hajj takes place at the beginning of each and every lunar calendar month. So where does the idea of slaughtering an animal for the rest of the world come from? If Allah in the Quran says that the offerings, the sacrifice of an animal has to take place in Hajj, why is it that the entire Muslim world is observing Eid al-Adha? It's scary to say these things, I'll tell you why. When before, once the scholars said that the Hijjah is Hajj, and so that people do not go perform Hajj on a yearly basis, they told them, you know what? If you stay at home and you slaughter an animal, you don't cut your hair, and you don't uh, cut your nails, then you will get the exact reward as if you were in Hajj. This was a very dark, sadistic manipulation to make Muslims stay in their own countries and not go to Hajj for the sole purpose. No more revolts, no more something anti-government. It's 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 a matter. It's a, it's a matter. It really is. It aches your mind how much Islam is corrupted. So today, when you tell somebody oh, the Quran says, you go, uh huh. The Quran is not complete. It needs the Sunnah to explain it. You are telling me that Allah is a liar? Allah said in the Quran that the Quran is independent. It doesn't need anybody to explain it. Everything is contained in the Quran. You are telling me? The, and believe it or not, this is what the Salafis say. They say, Al Quran ahwaju li sunnah min sunnah bil Quran. They say, the Quran is in much need of the Sunnah. And the Sunnah doesn't need the Quran. <laughs> what do you want more than this? I have explained the matter of the sacrifice. I've, I've, I've got a talk on YouTube which speaks about Hajj in details. Please go back there to know about uh, different views about the, the Qurbani, the slaughtering of the animal, things like that. But here, we just need to see why do Muslims slaughter on Eid al-Adha. And the general answer which is provided in our books and is repeated every year is that when people slaughter in Eid al-Adha, it is a sacred act to honor the tradition of the blessed prophet Ibrahim when he wanted to slaughter his son. And then when Allah stopped the killing and exchanged the life of Ismail with an animal, every year we slaughter to commemorate to celebrate what Ibrahim had done. And of course, they will uh, cover the story of Ibrahim with total submissiveness to Allah. Ibrahim was taught, he was ready to kill his son to please Allah. The question is then, Allah knows what's inside me. He knows what's inside you. Why would Allah put Ibrahim through this difficult test to slaughter his son, to prove to Allah that he loves him. What's wrong with this God? This, this God has some real serious issues. He doesn't know, puts people to, through impossible tests just to prove to him that they are with him. Of course, Allah doesn't do these things. Allah, as I said earlier on, is free from humans. Allah is not dependent on what we feel towards Him. The entire earth curses Allah. It doesn't take anything from Him. The entire earth praises the goodness of Allah and how beautiful He is and how everything awesome about Allah is. It doesn't make Him blush. 
Allah is completely free from us. He is not dependent on what we feel about Allah. Yet in our Islam, we laugh at the Jews and Christians when they say, oh, you know what? Jacob, Yaqub, uh, spent the whole night wrestling with God. And at the break of dawn, none of both could defeat the other one. The God could not defeat Jacob. Jacob could not defeat the, uh, Allah. And we laugh at that look and we say to, with big mouth, we say, <laughs> that is kufr. How can a human being wrestle with Allah? Yet we put Allah in the same plate. Emotionally deranged God that would ask of a human being to slaughter his son just to prove a love for God. I would not believe in this God a split of a second. Why should I, why should I kill my son to prove to you that I love you? If you don't know what's inside me, then how can you claim in the Quran or any other book that you know what's inside us? You've said this so many times in the Quran. You know what's in, the moment we think it, you know it. The moment we feel it, you know it. But it's, 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 uh, but anyhow, let's carry on with what one of the hadiths states. The narrator is our mother Aisha. It is reported that she said that the messenger of Allah said, on the day of sacrifice, no one does a deed more pleasing and more loved by Allah than the shedding of blood, i.e. slaughtering the animal. The sacrifice will come on the day of resurrection, she carries on, with its horns, hair and hoofs. And the blood is accepted by Allah before it falls on the ground. So, be merry about it. I repeat this hadith narrative. Aisha reports that the messenger of Allah said, on the day of sacrifice, no one does a deed more pleasing and loved by Allah than the shedding of the blood, i.e. when you slaughter the animals. Aisha carries on saying, the sacrifice will come on the day of resurrection with its horns, its hairs, and its hoofs, and the blood is accepted by Allah before it falls on the ground. So, the messenger says, be merry about it, be happy about it. This hadith is reported by at tirmidhi Ibn Majah, and many others, and is authenticated and classified as Sahih, i.e. true and authentic, by Al-Albani. Al-Albani died in 1999. According then to this narrative, we are supposed to understand that the blood of the animals, the reward is huge, and the blood of the animal reaches Allah before it touches the ground. This is a physical description of the deed. If you slaughter, let's say, in New York City, and I live in London, and I will tell you, when you slaughter the animal, when the blood falls before it reaches your ground, it has already reached me. I understand by that, that I get part of the blood. And before it gets to me, to you, it gets to me first. So, now, this, <laughs> this is a hadith, authentic, mentioned by the Prophet and many other scholars, yeah? The same messenger is the one who recited the following ayah from the Quran that Allah said, كَذَلِكَ سَخَّرْنَاهَا لَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ As such, we have made them, speaking about the cattle, subordinate to you, I mean under our control, we do what we please with them, so that you may be appreciative. Well, what Allah is telling us is this. If he has made the cow, the horse, the camel, the donkey, the sheep, the goats, the chicken, all these animals, under our control, we do with them as we please, that is a great deed by Allah. Because Allah could have made the sheep ferocious and dangerous like lions and we would never be able to catch them. Or much less slaughter and eat them. 
So when Allah has turned the sheep so docile, so docile or docile, I don't know how to say, and and so you, a baby can play with the sheep and not be scared of it, that certainly is a deed, a bounty that Allah has granted us. As I said, he could have made uh, the donkey dangerous like a crocodile, and that's it. We're not going to be able to use the donkey or the horse, whatever. So that's what Allah is saying, that he has made the cattle subordinate to us under our uh, control so that we be appreciative of what Allah has done. And then Allah, and as I said before, the entire Hajj is to show our appreciation for Allah and that's why we slaughter at the end of the Hajj it never is about sins and but anyhow and then Allah makes this statement he says when we slaughter the animal people of course would accept certain things yeah so here is what Allah says to them he says neither the meat of the animals we slaughtered nor the blood reaches Allah but it is rather your piety that reaches him as I said the sad news is this ayah is mentioned in Surah Al-Hajj that talks about Al-Hajj that's Surah number 22 and the ayah's number is 36 and 37 in other words what Allah is saying is the physical aspect of the animal is slaughter be that the hoof the horn the, the, the blood the things like that does not reach Allah not meet nothing but it is our piety that reaches Allah reaches Allah as in accepted refused things like that so how come a prophet that has received this Quran would spew lies he says that the blood of the animal is accepted by Allah before it falls on the ground it is it's 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 what kind of a messenger is this really what kind of a man is this why would Allah let him say this why does Allah allow his messenger to change the religion Allah says something Muhammad says something else people follow what Muhammad says it no longer is the religion of Allah but rather more the religion of Muhammad and if they say that oh no 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 Rasulullah cannot speak Muhammad cannot speak out of himself it is a revelation from Allah then we have a far more dangerous question to ask is why does Allah contradict himself in the Quran he says something but in the hadith he says the opposite the exact opposite of what he said in the Quran well that's not true what Allah wanted us to believe in follow is in the Quran and the Quran alone anything else it's a lie. It's, 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 it's something that has been added later on. Of course, the sheikhs would go out and do all kinds of acrobatic motions to give the Quran a different meaning, to bring the two together. Even if the statement of the hadith contradicts that of the Quran, they will find a way to make you accept both ways. Humans, we are very strong at argumenting, at arguing our case. Believe me, if a thief is a thief, he breaks into your house, steals and goes out. But if we catch the thief, or when we catch the thief, and we're gonna ask the thief, why did, he's gonna justify his deed in such a manner that we accept it. But we say, yeah, 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 I can see what you, he will tell you, you know what, I tried to get a job, I couldn't get a job. I tried to do this, I didn't, there was this, there was this, uh, and I'm really sorry I broke into your house and I stole that, but it's a necessity, not a vice. And we can, like, and if we accept from a thief why he did what he did, then we might as well accept what the drug dealers does. The drug dealers today, they, they, they kill people, they, they are violent, they, they kill for 10 pounds or 10 dollars, they spread evil, they ruin people's lives. And when you speak to, and I had the time once, I had the occasion to speak to one of them, and I asked him, why did you do that? And he's, he's supposedly like he's a Muslim, he tells me there is nothing like La ilaha illallah. I told him, if you believe la ilaha illallah why do you do what you do why is it that you ruin people's lives and you know it's wrong he goes brother I tried to do a job I tried to do that I have bills to pay and things like that I'm really sorry I don't feel good about it I'm really sorry but it's a necessity and he justifies the sale of drugs as if he's talking about why he should be out in the rain 
And this is exactly what the sheikhs do. I call them the mechanics, the religion mechanics. They bring and they say certain stuff to force and then people are confused 1500 years after the death of the messenger and we are still as confused as, as, as God knows one. If the, someone else came the other day and they say this a lot to me, they say, I only accept hadith that agrees with the Quran. And I always interject and I say, no, any hadith that agrees with the Quran is the first hadith I refuse. Because if the hadith contradicts the Quran, this is easy. I throw the hadith away, I accept the Quran. No matter what they say, even if it's the entire earth that says I'm wrong, I don't care. Now, if someone brings to me a hadith that agrees with the Quran, I disregard the hadith because simply I don't need it. If it agrees with the Quran, why do I take two? One is enough for me. When Allah says in the Quran, do not lie or do not commit fornication, that is enough for me. I don't need 100 hadiths that agree with the Quran and then I ignore the Quran, leave it behind and we'll start just mentioning the hadith, the hadith, the hadith, the hadith, as if Allah has no input in this situation. No, if there is one hadith that agrees with one Quran, that hadith must be disregarded. If the hadith doesn't agree with the Quran, that hadith must be disregarded. Nothing should compete with the Quran, not a thing. But the problem is we didn't do that. In another hadith, this hadith is also authentic by Tirmidhi Ahmed ibn Majah and is authentic. It reads as follows. Zayd ibn Arqam, one of the narrators of the hadith, said, the companions of Allah's messenger asked him the significance of these sacrifices, meaning when they slaughter an animal, what does it signify? What do we do? He replied, it is the sunnah i.e. the custom of your father Ibrahim. They asked, and what reward will we receive from that? He answers, for every hair of the animal, you will receive a blessing. They asked, and what about the wool, the entire wool of it? He replied, for every hair of its wool, you will receive a good Deed. And that's why Muslims slaughter, they want at all costs. Uh, so today people want to do the Qurbani, want to slaughter, what for? It's just there. But why? Why do you do that? What do you do? Yeah, I just want to do it because it's part of the Eid. I don't need to know why. No, you need to know why. You need to know why. But it's, it's, uh, but anyhow, the truth behind those sacrifices in Hebrew, the name of these animal sacrifices are called <laughs> korbanot, korbanot, B Pakistani, Indian, they call it korbani, the Arab today, they call it korbani. Korbani is the translation of the word korbanot to korbani, it's just it's a different thing. But the conflict, the, the, the slaughtering every year that Muslims do is a direct response to the conflict between the people of the book and the Muslims. And we are also people of the book. The Jews and the Muslims have always battled it out. Since long ago until now until the end. But it started in the third century. In the third century a conflict broke out. And since that time, it never ended until now. This conflict is this. Who was the child that Ibrahim was going to slaughter? The Bible has spoken about this. And the Quran has spoken about this. Both of these books, of course, the Injil, the Gospel of Jesus, also spoke about this. That Abraham was about to slaughter one of his children. And then Allah stopped the act. And... Uh, gave uh, in place another sacrifice. So the Muslims, our scholars, they, they, have, they hold two opinions. Half of these scholars, they say the kid or the child that was going to be slaughtered was Ishaq. And the other side of our scholars, they say it was Ismail, Ishmael or Isaac. So the Muslims world is the Muslim world or the scholars in the Muslim world are split into two. Half says it's Ishaq, Isaac, and the other half says it is Ishmael. However, 
The Jewish scholars and the rabbi, all of them agree it was Isaac. They don't mention Ishmael at all. So if I have to deal now with the percentage of the situation, if I take the Jews and the Muslims and mingle them together, I would say that Ishaq gets 75% of the equation because the, the Jews, even though the Jews go for the 100%, but I'm just going to go 50-50. So the Ishaq gets 75%, Ishmael gets 25%. At Tabari and few other scholars, they all agree that it was Ishaq, and he explains this in his book of the Tafsir and few others. And of course, nowadays we always mention Ismail, Ismail. Why? Simple, because the Islam we have today is a direct product of the Saudi people. The Saudis agree that it is Ismail, they printed it, they preached it, and nowadays is what we know, even though in our books. There are those who say it is Isaac and not Ishmael. And this is, let me, let me narrate to you the biblical Hebrew version of the event and what the Jews and Christians believe in, and then what we Muslims believe in, and you are going to find out that what the Jews and Christians and what we believe in is not far from each other. Reason, the Quran, when it spoke about what Ibrahim and his child went through, it was in ayah or two. But in our books of the uh, prophet's lives and this and that, how they told the story is a direct translation of what it is in the Bible. Here is, here is what it happens, yeah? The, the, the title of the chapter in this uh, book, it's called Abraham Tested. And this book here is uh, always our sheikhs, they always tell us that Ibrahim was tested. That what they say is taken from this here, from Abraham Tested. Okay, what was he? Uh, and this translation is taken from the New International Version. They always refer to it as NIV. NIV. This, uh, what I'm going to read, is in the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Genesis is the book of how, uh, the, in it, is they speak about how Allah began the creation. Al-Bukhari started his book of the authentic hadith also with the book of Genesis. He copied the, the Torah. But anyhow, from uh, chapter 22, from verse 1 to 19, I'm just going to read. I don't, I'm not going to spend time on it. It's, it's self-explicit. It starts like this. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He, uh, God, said to him, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love i gotta say this this your only son whom you love is some jew somewhere because of the conflict with muslims added this i am 100 percent allah wouldn't say that because if abraham at that time had one son it's uh, god doesn't need your only son whom you love but this is your only son and whom you love is exactly how the sheikhs have injected the hadith in Allah's Islam. The Jews have injected these human uh, things in the word of God. Uh, what can we say? Take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Moriah is where the dam of the rock is uh, on the mount uh, is today. Today when the Palestinians, you know that golden dome of the rock? That's Moriah. So Allah ordered Ibrahim, back then there was no uh, building as such. So he tells him, take him on, the, on that mount and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on that mountain. I will show you. So what Allah is telling Ibrahim, take your son Ishaq, your only son that you love a lot, take him to the mount where the Dome of the Rock is today, and that's why the Jews want that place back, is because the Jews and Christians believe that that is a sacred. Uh, right now I am working on a topic about the Holy Land, why it's sacrificed, who owns it, and things like that, and I will go into more details about the Dome of the Rock, why it's so important to both Jews, Christians, and Muslims, who built the history, and a few other things uh, that you will... Uh, uh, get to know uh, uh, that. But in this time here, Moriah is that place there. Early the next morning, Abraham 
got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac or Ishaq. When he had cut enough wood, because Ibrahim is supposed to go there, build an altar. Altar is like a table where you sacrifice, put the wood there and then burn it later on uh, with, uh, with the meat of the animal or whoever you're gonna sacrifice on there so that it burns and that's that. But anyhow, so Ibrahim went there with, he cut enough wood and he set out for the place God had told him about, which is the mount where the Dome of the Rock today, which is called in the Bible Moriah. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. God told him he's going to show him, yeah? So now Abraham, on the third day, when he got there, Allah showed him where he should go. All right. Chapter, uh, verse 5. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Ishaq. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. So there you go. The picture is like the Ishaq, the son, is carrying the wood. Ibrahim is carrying uh, uh, something else and the fire, uh, the fire and the knife. 7. Ishaq spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Ibrahim replied. The fire and wood are here, Ishaq said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 8. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. 9. When they reached the place God has told him about, Abraham built an altar. Altar is that table where you sacrifice uh, whatever you're going to sacrifice. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound then his son Isaac, Ishaq, and laid him on the altar and on top of the wood. So now you have the table, you've got the wood, and then you've got his son Ishaq <laughs> bound and on the wood. SubhanAllah. 10. Then he, i.e. Abraham, reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. 11. But the angel of the Lord, Jibril, called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. 12. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. 13. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket. A thicket is, is, is uh, when you see a lot of trees and bushes and they are thickened together. The, you, you hardly can go through them. And there he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as burnt offering instead of his son. 14. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. That place is where the dome of the rock is built upon. And to this day it is said, on the mount of the Lord it will be provided. That's how it's known uh, between Jews and Christians. 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. 18. And through your offspring, this is Allah still speaking, yeah, uh, to Abraham, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me.
19, Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Beersheba is a small place not far from Jerusalem. This is the story in great details, as is narrated in the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible under Genesis. And as I said earlier on, this story in all its entirety is told to Muslims by our sheikhs with a few omissions here and there. Some changes here, some there. And instead of putting Ishaq there, they put Ismail. And that's how we get all these things. And these contradictions between the Jews and the Muslims, since us Muslims, we are not going to accept anytime soon that the kid or the child who was going to be slaughtered was Ishaq. Because by accepting, by accepting that it is Ishaq, there are other events in history, like the prophets being the, the, the son of the two men who were going to be slaughtered, his father Abdullah and Ismail. And then it will challenge the, uh, the, the, the belonging of the Prophet Muhammad to Ismail. But here is a big problem we have. Ibrahim was not a Jew. That's fine. But he has two children. And since we always, uh, uh, always go back and we consider the child to belong to the country of his father, not the mother. Let me explain. If we take someone from a foreign country, that marries to an English woman, right? Even if the children are white, let's say somebody is from Italy, a blonde man with blue eyes, marries to an English lady, blonde, blue eyes. The children come blonde and blue eyes. When we speak to the children, we say to them, oh, you are, we always ask, where is your daddy from? They go from Italy. Ah, oh, you are from Italy. Straight away, we link the child to his father. And this is throughout the world. So now the question comes here. Since Ibrahim has two children, Ishaq and Ismail, right? Doesn't it make the Prophet Muhammad come from the same race as Ibrahim and in which case from Iraq? Because uh, Ibrahim was from Iraq. Of course, at that time it was Babylon, the Babylonian. It's, it's got nothing to do with the Iraq of today. But nonetheless, Ibrahim was not an Arab. Ishaq was not an Arab. Ismail was not an Arab. Arab, and as such, even if Ismail marries from an Arab people, his children are not Arabs. They go back to their dad, and which means the offspring of Ismail has nothing to do with the Arabs, just like the offspring of Ishaq has nothing to do with whatever they grew up with. And here it creates another far deeper problem for everybody including us and the Arab hood of the messenger. Ishaq's death was never a possibility, as the Jews always say. They say not as far as Abraham was concerned, i.e. Ibrahim was not going to slaughter his child no matter what. He was just following instructions, but when push came to shove, he would not slaughter his uh, kid. And they say, and as far as God was concerned, also, letting Ishaq die uh, by the hand of his father was not a possibility. The, and they said the commandment to Abraham was very specific and Ibrahim understood it. Just take your son and act the act and the killing will not take place. And that's what gave Abraham the confidence to do what he did. The, 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 the Jews and Christians believe that the Quran got it wrong, that the kid is Ishaq. We Muslims, we say, no, the Jews and Christians got it wrong, the kid is Ismail, even though half of our scholars say it is Ishaq. But what does Allah say in the Quran? Would you believe it? Allah does not name the child for such an event. Allah doesn't name the child. Who's the child? Eh? He just referred to him by characteristics. And when we try to understand what Allah says, 
And if we empty our minds, we don't have a preconceived ideas ahead of time, we just go to look for the truth, we find that the child is Ishaq, nothing to do with Ismail. But if we go with the idea that it is Ismail, we will turn the necks of every ayah in the Quran to make it mean it is Ismail, when in fact it is not. But anyhow, it's a, as I said, talking about this is a story to another. Uh, so the story of the slaughtering of the kid, the child, has got an agenda behind it. The Jews, they cannot accept it's Ishmael because it challenges the core of their own existence and all the events that took place and, and the Ishaq wrestling with God and so many things would fall apart. So they have to maintain it's Ishaq. For us Muslims, we cannot admit that it is Ishaq because it also puts so many things in jeopardy. Now, in the third century, the idea that the child was Ishaq was gaining ground. And scholars started saying, oh, you know what? It is not Ismail, but rather Ishaq. And what did then, at that time, that the institution under the, the protection of the government do? They invented the idea of the 10 days of the Hijjah and made Muslims around the world slaughter an animal on Eid al-Adha to commemorate the idea that Ibrahim was going to slaughter his child to keep these traditions alive and that we never ever accept that the child could possibly be Ishaq, it's 50-50%. And that's why every year when we slaughter, we keep in a lie alive. It's got nothing to do with Hajj. All these rewards invented in the Hadith are just to make Muslims do what the sheikhs, what the religious institution wanted them to do. And every year as we slaughter, the idea that the child is Ismail, not Ishaq, deepens in our hearts and in our souls. Eid al-Adha's sacrifice is an invented lie. For when it comes to the Quran, what it says, only people in Hajj slaughter as a means to commemorate and appreciate the gift that Allah has given us over these animals. Out of that, it's a politically motivated act to keep the people always believing that it is Ishmael that was going to be slaughtered and not Ishaq. In conclusion, my dear sisters and my brothers, cattle sacrifices was only, still is only prescribed for the pilgrims in Hajj. Hajj takes place at any one time in the entire year for me and for you to begin doing our Hajj, we need to wait for the new moon and start. Just to give you an example. Let's say I go with my sister to Hajj. When I get there, uh, let's say Rabi'ul Awwal, the first month of Rabi'a, which is the third month of the Islamic uh, calendar. I see the new moon begin Rabi'ul Awwal and I decide to do my Hajj. I go perform my rituals and slaughter my animal, finish my Hajj, end of it. My sister, she's procrastinating, she goes, you know what, I'll do it next time. The next new moon comes in and she doesn't do it. And, and then the, after that, the third new moon comes in, she goes, that's it, I'm going to do it. And she performs her Hajj. And me, I'm enjoying my life, I'm hunting, I'm sleeping, I'm doing whatever. And she's performing her Hajj. It is her Hajj, not mine. She slaughtered her animal, not me. She goes to Arafah, not me. And I don't care when she does that, as long as she waits for the new moon to begin and she just performs Hajj. Now imagine this. We are 1.5 or 6 or 7, 8 billion people on earth that believe in Allah and things like that. Imagine people going to Hajj throughout the year. We have 12 opportunities to be in Hajj, to do Hajj. And this is a hoax of slaughtering a lamb around the world remains just that, a hoax. The world will be a much, much better place. If we dig deeper in the Quran, we will find that, as I said, the child that was about to be sacrificed is more Ishaq than Ismail.
The child that was to be sacrificed was living and had grown with his father. Ismail didn't grow and was not with his father. But anyhow, these are, as I said, arguments for another day. Hajj, my dear sisters and my brothers, is opened or should be pro opened throughout the year. And so is the Umrah. The only thing that separates the two is your intention and the rituals you do. Apart from that, nothing else. But the sheikhs have chosen to lie to us. Every year they make the 10 days of the Hijjah seem a big shot. Why? Because they don't want us to believe and think of the other 11 months where Hajj can be performed. They make it seem like the best and the only Hajj months to be done are these 10 days of the Hijjah, nothing else. They lie to us. They lie to us and they continue to lie to us. Hey, what can we say? Today, if I decide to go to do a Umrah uh, or do a Hajj, for example, in month number six, when I arrive to Saudi Arabia, uh, people are going to see me wearing ihram. They're going to say he's doing Umrah. But when I go to Arafah, I'll be the only one standing there. And guess what? You will get the authorities coming to you. What are you doing here? And if you tell them, oh, I'm doing my uh, Hajj Arafah, they're going to either think you're crazy you are crazy or someone who's gonna start a revolution it's one or the other and both ways you end up either in a psychiatric hospital or in jail you cannot go to Arafah in the middle of the year because according to them that's not the time for Hajj when the Quran if it could scream it will scream until it loses its voice Hajj must be performed in the well-known months of the entire year. All you gotta do is wait for the new moon to begin and then you go perform your Hajj. But since we have chosen to ignore what Allah says, since we have demeaned the Quran, since we have attacked its truth, that's why Muslims as long as we follow the hadith narratives, these human mockeries, these human lies that have been added to Allah's Islam, as long as we still keep putting the sheikhs in pedestal and think of them as God sent humans on earth, as long as we keep not listening to the Quran and taking it seriously, we will always be in the state that we have been for the last 1500 years. Losers, nothing for, to account for, nothing, absolutely not a thing. I will close my talk here by mentioning a story. The other day I was talking to somebody and on, on similar topics, not precisely this one, but uh, I was telling him about the Quran. And then he said, Yahi, when we follow the Quran and the Sunnah, we had a civilization. I said, A, we're not supposed to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, we're supposed to follow the Quran all alone. Of course, that went for another, but that's not the conversation I want to talk now about. And then he goes, civilization. I said, what civilization are you on about? He goes, we were, I said, Muslims have never, ever had any civilization. He goes, no, we did. I said, if you go to a Roman, if you go to a Greek, if you go to an Egyptian, if you go to a, someone from Babylon, if you go to the Incas, if you, uh, Yamas, if, if you go to around the world, Chinese, and, you tell, and they tell you we have civilization, guess what? They have something to show you to prove what they're saying. The wall of China, you go to the pyramids, or you the Romans, you go around the, the world, you've got different ruins. The, 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 the Greeks, they have everything there to show you that they had civilizations. But we Muslims, show me something that accounts for our civilization. Absolutely not a single thing that shows at one point we were a civilization. Not a thing. And then, and then when he thought for a second, it's true, we've got nothing to show for that. He goes, yeah, he, we invented the science. I said, what did we invent? And <laughs> to his detriment, he said, he goes, without zero, the world wouldn't know what to do. We invented the zero and today computers, they work on zero one. I said, do you really believe in that? Do you think the great Roman uh, scientists and scholars, philosophers, do you think the Greeks with all the math, the theorems and uh, Pythagoras and all these things, Socrates and all these people, how did they do the math in that time when they didn't have zero? 
and he looks at me and I told him the zero existed well before the Arabs as you say found it it's just the Arabs were very good at stealing from pleasuring other people on the third century when they started the tr translations of other books to Arabic they started lying and <laughs> administering to themselves things that people had had before them and I said, and the zero is just one of these things that the Arabs say it's ours, but they actually stole it from other civilizations. My dear sisters and my brothers, Hajj is to be performed throughout the year, any month of the year. You go, all you have to do is when you arrive to the Hajj time, you gotta wait for the new moon of that calendar. When you And when you see the new moon, you intend Hajj and you perform your Hajj. If you are in a group of people, you do it in month one and, and, and your friend does it in month two and your friend does it in month three, that's absolutely fine. You just wait for the new month. Until we bring the Quran back to the driving seat, I pray to Allah to help us promote the great message of Al-Islam through the Quran. Anything else is a human addition that had eaten at the Quran has falsified Allah's religion, has corrupted Allah's religion, and we are still paying the price because all we are doing is keeping an old lie alive. And today, the biggest guardians that are keeping the lie, the falsification, the manipulation, all these things that are against Allah's Islam are the Sunni, the Salafi uh, cult. Of course, the Shia as well. And things like that. I pray to Allah this opens your eyes and adds a little bit to what you already got and I wish you all the best and please stick to the Quran anyone who comes to sell you something that is not Allah say don't accept it even if they say Jibreel and the messenger came together and told me this just put it in the trash that's where it belongs I pray to Allah that you all are doing well. Please do take care of your good selves. Love your family. Love your neighbors. And be good to people. That's what pays off on Judgment Day. This is again your brother Abdus Salam. And I wish you all best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You be all good.